ban, you know, champions by picking them and then not having them available for your opponent next game. They are allowed to pick them. So it basically comes down to do you save picks for later or do you just go for your strongest uh, team first and then kind of just use whatever you have left available? A lot of times, um, I, when I've seen this in other games, a lot of times what happens is you'll pick four extremely strong champions and then mm -hmm. your fifth is like a champion that is pretty good but not the best possible for that situation so that in the later game you pick you pick that champion later because you know they're overpowered and then you go for like a situation where that champion can carry the game so sometimes you kind of just you mix and match you go for like 80 percent power and it ends up working out that way but uh, sometimes it can backfire mm -hmm. obviously yeah and this is very interesting for the all-around bands all-around picks right this would really test out the limit of your hero pool this would test out the versatility of yourself and your teammates and even the enemy team when it comes to drafting against each other because of course when you don't have some selections in the champion pool if something goes through against the enemy team and the counter pick was picked in the game one you need to think of something else yeah Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and it can lead to some interesting um, kind of bamboozle, bamboozles or, you know, ways to kind of uh, checkmate your opponent, right? Where you, you pick a certain comp, you wait to pick a certain comp in maybe game two or game three, and then you know that there's no really good counter to it available on the other side because it's been picked before. So look for that here from particularly 16-bit, I would say. Um, it's, it did seem they didn't, like they didn't have the, the most cohesive of lineups last game, so maybe they're going to be looking for that now. We already have the Wukong Lulu combination here, getting in with both of those ultimates for maximum knockups and maximum pain here, Infinity. Mm hmm. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting. Camille can come through. So I don't think Kennen would come through for Omega Esports right now. I think Camille is one of the counter picks for Kennen. So maybe Omega Esports is thinking of another champion to use in Garen and Vi, something that is very sustainable. They're probably thinking of just funneling all in onto the gin when it comes to damage for this game number two for sure uh and the other thing is i, I think that garen doesn't seem you know for a lot of people he seems like a very basic pick but what what mm -hmm. omega is going for here is just to match the um the camille right you just want to have someone who can kind of match her in lane not going to get com completely bullied out and that's what garen's going to provide here uh against the camille but especially because you know he can kind of even if he gets behind in the trade, he can kind of run away, heal up a little bit, come back. So it's really hard to bu completely bully Garen out of his lane. Yeah. And when it comes to a 1v1 type of setup in the Baron lane, when it comes to Garen and Camille, I think Garen has the advantage, right? When it mm. comes to the early game, because you have the constant damage coming in from that Garen and Camille's power spike is level 3, level 4. When she has her ultimate, that is when she spike up. And Garen is more sustainable when it comes to the early game is more powerful when it comes to early game so i think camille would have our time and i am assuming camille would probably go for more of the safe play early into the matchup first five minutes of the game first three minutes of the game and when she has her items up when she has her ultimate up that's when she goes through against the 1v1 against garen yeah, uh, taking a look at the rest of this draft, looks like Ezreal and the Gragas have been locked in. Mm -hmm. So here for 16-bit, I, I like this draft quite a bit more than their game number one draft. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. they had very strong champions in game number one, but game number two seems much more cohesive. You have that Wukong-Lulu combination. You have the Camille doing the nice split, split pushing and being available for any sort of uh, you know singular picks if they want to go for that. And then Ezreal and Gragas, I, I think they're a little bit better in... In kind of scattered fights, like chaotic fights, where people are kind of mm -hmm. uh, split around. But I think it's going to be perfectly fine here. They'll be able to put enough damage into uh, make that work, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Although it's it's actually quite contrasting having the Gragas and the Wukong at the same draft, right? Because Gragas splits splits everyone up, and Wukong yep. is an AOE type of knock up situation. So when you're considering those two types of heroes. How is it going to come through in terms of synergy? Is it going to be like an all-in Gragas only then later when they group up before the Wukong comes through? That would be the question, right? Yeah, I don't... Um, I think it's kind of a hedge, right? I, I don't... Obviously, like you mentioned, um, they're not the best synergy, but it's kind of like you can use either or, right? If you're in a kind of a chaotic mm -hmm. situation, yeah. you can go for Gragas ult. Uh, and if you're in a more like... If everyone's kind of gr grouped together... 
you can have the Wukong ult combined with a Lilian, or excuse me, the Lulu ult on top of the Wukong to make sure that that goes off. So it's kind of like whatever type of situation, if the, the opponent's spread out, if they're grouped together, it'll probably work out. The one thing you don't want to see is Wukong jump in and then Greg is kind of like grief his own teammate, right? That would yeah. that would that would be a disaster. So that's the only thing you don't want to see here if you're 16 bit. Mm -hmm. Although I I also like how 16 bit gear is doing their draft. As you've stated, I think you've already stated all the points, right? The the mobility from Ezreal puts him at a safe position. You have the Gragas Wukong to either um initiate the fight or break out a fight when it comes to danger zone for their team. And Camille to try and set it up against the Jin as a 1v1. Right with the ultimate locking him down. If we're the side of Mega Esports, we could actually talk about it as well because it is a lot of you know ganking potential when it comes to their draft picks. You have the Vi to also go for the lockdown against one enemy team and go for that burst damage potential on a single target. You have the guy to finish it all off as well. Brom and potentially Oriana for the side of Mega Esports to also initiate the fight. So it's gonna be very interesting to see. How it's gonna turn out. So right now, I think it's switched up. Right, Omega Esports really strong when it comes to you know the the team fight potential. 16-bit gear may potentially be a little bit behind when it comes to that because of the Gragas and Wukong ultimate not having you know the best of relationship. Right. I I, I do feel like just in terms of abilities, right? It, it feels like 16-bit has has a very synergistic comp. Um, as far as Omega is concerned, it feels like their comp is synergistic just based on pure roles, right? You have three mm -hmm. yeah. you have three members who can kind of engage, kind of just be in the front lines, and then two heavy damage uh, backline uh, damage dealers, right? So it's just kind of it's very stable, very traditional. You have your front line, you have your back line, you do a lot of damage. Uh, Jin and Oriana work reasonably well together because they both have a lot of uh, AOE as far as you know the traps coming up from Jin. Um, obviously, you have the um, <clears throat> the curtain call that can come out, and that kind of pairs well when you have an Oriana as well. So I think that both teams have drafted reasonably well. I think I like 16-bit mm -hmm. gears uh, draft a little bit more, but considering how dominant Omega was in game number one, uh, I'm not really ready to kind of pick a pick a team here to win. Absolutely, and yeah. I think it's it's a matter of the execution, right? Because sure. uh, in the game one, we were stating, you know what? 16-bit gear really having a great synergy when it comes to team fights. But at the end of the day, Smart Omega has won it all based, of, and it, based on execution, based on objectives that they've taken throughout the game number one. So it's game number two. Let's see on how it's going to turn out for this game. Yeah, it looks like we have a switch on our sides, or sorry, sorry, switch in the, the sides of the map. So we're going to have blue team uh, on our, or we have our 16-bit team in the blue on our bottom left side. And spawning in the top right was uh, our Omega Smart team, Smart Omega, whatever you want to call it. A smart, the Smart obviously being the sponsor of them. And already you see the Oriana getting up to a good start against the Greg. It's just, <laughs> just auto attack, right? It's just, it works yeah. pretty well. So this is going to be something to, to keep in mind too. We, we talked about the overall team fight strategies. Neither team really have a split push composition. Um, so both teams are going to be looking to team fight. But as far as the early game is concerned, looks like Oriana is already getting the better hand. The upper hand, I should say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the range of the Oriana and the spam of the skills that she could deal out massive amounts of damage onto that Graga. So it's a basically... Uh, Gragas would have the disadvantage early into the matchup, but when it comes to mid-game, late-game, I think Gragas would scale out in Power Spike. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned, actually, is that I just realized now, since we always follow time-lapse, but whenever we had the actual streams and we didn't have Spectator mode, we always follow time-lapse, and he was absolutely devastating on the Jin. So keep in mind uh, that that portion, as that, that factor as well, is we could see some really high-level Jin play, and if he does you know, pull out an extremely good Jin game here, then that could be lights out for 16 bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the curtain call is just really, really strong to just, you know, zone out the enemy team first of all and make them in panic. Because what are you going to do? You don't know where the gym would put the curtain call. And I think what is very important for the side of 16 bit gear on this game is the Camille to try and ultimate the gin as soon as possible, as much as possible when it comes to team fights. And that would mean the potential advantage if they could get the Jin, because that would put Smart Omega lacking in terms of damage. Oh, here comes a potential gank here. The, the, the engage comes in from the Vi, but as expected, as expected the uh, Camille is able to get out of there. Scott free. 
speaking of a conditional gain, Wukong put some damage onto the Braum, but he's able to dash on out of there. Good play by the Jin to help him use that dash. Uh, note to all you uh, ADCs out there, all you all you people, you got to support your support. Everyone out there, you got to support mm -hmm. your support. You got to be there when you know. You got to know your support's abilities. And in that situation, obviously, Jin allowing for his support to dash away to him safely. Yeah, you're you're not just an ADC. You're the support of the support. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Right? and if you don't, yeah, in, in multiple, in more ways than one, right? Obviously, that, that was an obvious example of providing an escape mm -hmm. route. But uh, sometimes, you know, if you're not providing enough damage, then your support's going to die. <laughs> you support yeah. your support by killing the opponent as well. Of <laughs> An obvious statement to make, but uh, it's just something to keep in mind as we continue to have these, like, little skirmishes. Um, Jin, unable to hit that route there, but Jin... You know, time lapse in the past has been very good at hitting those roots. Uh, speaking mm -hmm. of engages here, we have the oh, oh my goodness, you coming out from the uh, from the Garen almost gets the kill oh. on to the Camille. Camille actually, Garen nearly dies to the minions there, and uh, Camille mm. potentially could have finished off that kill if she was a little bit more uh, persistent. Obviously, you don't really want to be hanging around with so little um, life, but uh, Camille gonna get on another. Has to use the flash to get away though, and as we see the rotation, the switcheroo. And the Jin and Brom going into this lane. That's like something we didn't mention. In Infinity. Uh, they both teams actually switched the lanes up, so they were both both dual lane or yeah, both of the dual lanes were up in the Baron lane at the start of the game. Mhm. Mm yeah, and that, that that is what I'm stating a while ago when it comes to the game, right? Garen has the advantage early into the matchup against Camille, and Camille would have a hard time to try and scale out or put the Garen down because of the sustainability, because of his skills and passive. So that is the annoying thing about Garen, but when it comes to the ultimate of the Camille already, when it comes to the range and the defensive potential into the mid game, late game, she would have the more power spike against the Garen. But nevertheless, D2 are now going in for the Dragon Spit. They're having their sights locked in for the Dragon Spit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, looks like we had a bit of a change from last game. For our last game, we had. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a 16 bit go for the dragon first, but this time it was Omega, that, or yeah, that went for it in the beginning. Um, and actually, oh, hold the phone here. Or Oriana actually does go down. They get yet another kill as well. And um, they're trying to hold on to the situation, but really good jump in here from 16 bit gear. Sorry, I was like thinking about the like <laughs> how the game was progressing to this point. I didn't realize uh, 16 bit was going to get so serious about that. They do get two kills and they get on out of there. Yeah, I, I was thinking they're going in for the Dragon most probably because in game one they did it. But you know what? They changed things up. They put into a different path into this game. They went in for that early aggression, right? You have the Wukong to knock up the enemy teams. You have the damage output coming in from that Ezreal with the mobility. So I think they had the advantage when it comes to ganking out the enemy team. But D2, take it away. Yeah, exactly. they're really going for it now. It looks like Omega was trying to go for the, the dragon. It was taken by someone, I'm not really sure, but the Vi already goes down. 16 bits deep into this fight. Wukong is extremely low. It ends up going down to the Orianna in the end. Garen going down as well. Just I'm just looking at you know the, the, the notification on the screen there. The Wild Growth gets put onto one of our members here. She's going to have to use the flash to get out. It looks like it was the Ezreal. Um, but... Yeah, what a crazy fight that turned out to be. I'm actually looking forward to the replay because we weren't able to catch everything that happened in that situation. Looks like the dragon did go over to Omega. So right as they got the dragon, the engage comes in here from 16 bits and on full retreat was Omega as yeah, 16 bit really trying to get up in their face. Yeah. Uh I actually don't know what happened there, but the wild growth onto that Ezreal was actually necessary keep yep. him alive that gave him movement that gave him you know the potential to survive longer with a curtain call actually forced out by the Jin. but e2 for having engage. that red herald fight yeah exactly another potential engage coming in here the wukong is able to take the red herald in the end and a potentially 16 bit might want to go ahead and back off here and no skirmish in the end you know one thing i want to pay point your attention to though is the fact that the gold is actually the gold lead is in on the side of omega despite the fact that they have three fewer kills here that is extremely interesting to me Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the UD went for the the dragon was a part of getting that gold to their the, to their team, right? The the laning stage we're in, the, um, sixteen bit went in for that five man roan in the mid lane. But nevertheless, D yeah. two right now they made it back even. It's now that even when it comes to gold lead. Oh, can they get the kill? <laughs> Camille's trying to get on. Actually, uses the flash to go backwards. 
I'm surprised he didn't flash forward there. I think he could have gotten the kill. He already used the the wall jump in order to get closer to the uh, the Oriana, and this is going to be a, a problem as well as the fight. Right there. All right, testing, testing. Looks like we are back into the game. Sorry, we, we uh, lost our connection here with Dave for just a moment as we come back to it, and it looks like three members of 16-bit have gone down in the end. We we got cut off right as Vi connected with the Wukong to finish off that kill, despite the fact that the wild growth went on them. That, I mean, we didn't get to see it, but it looks like they were sitting ducks there for Omega, as Omega is on the comeback job. In fact, they, it wasn't even a comeback. Don't call it a comeback, guys, because they weren't even behind in gold in the first place. And now if we take a look at that gold, they are up a solid four and a half thousand infinity. This is really turning to Omega's favor right now. Yeah. And this is what I call a methodical play for Smart Omega. They've been known to do this, and they're showing it as now for League of Legends Wild Rift. And I think it's very, very important to take objectives, but Smart Omega is taking it to another level when it comes to objectives taken. Yeah, and the thing is, I don't really blame 16-bit for the way they're approaching this, right? They, I think, in mm -hmm. my opinion, they have the better team fight comp, and not only that, but they have the better kind of in-your-face team fight comp, right? They want to just kind of rush you down and, and, and kill you rather than uh, the more pokey style of Omega, and that's why you saw 16-bit get so extremely aggressive. But credit to Omega, they, they played reasonable defense. It didn't seem like it at first because they were, you know, they lost a couple members mid, but you know, other than that, they were able to cover the lanes, get some gold that way, get the dragon, and then pick their spots. And now, despite the fact that they're down one kill only, they still are holding on to a 4k gold lead. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to ADC role, I think Ezreal would probably scale out or you know, diminish when it comes to power into the late game. Because you had Jin that could just burst down the Ezreal, you had the Vi with the ultimate, right? So let's we see. A, we have an engage coming on here. The, the Vaya goes in, but she has to immediately go out. But oh my goodness, the curtain call, the bullet lands onto the Lulu, who is dropped. And that is a kill for free, at least in terms of uh, return kills here for Omega. Beautiful play coming out from time lapse on our Jin here. Looks like they're going to... Both teams are actually raring up for a fight. Both teams are getting extremely low. And big root coming out from the Jin, And they're able to finish off the Gragas. In comes the Hex. And they're able to finish off the Jin, But that comes at the cost of the life of Camille. And in goes the Vi with the engage. Gets one. Are they going to get two? Wukong desperately trying to get away. And there is the flash in and the finish of that kill. We have a 6-9 in uh, kill count for either team. That's very nice in my opinion. <laughs> but so, oh my goodness. Omega is playing out of their mind at the moment, just completely bopping 16-bit right here. Yeah, I mean, they needed to force that, but I wasn't expecting that to happen exactly, right? The Graga has to be picked off by the enemy team that easily when it comes to the fight, right? The damage output from Smart Omega is just there. And look at that, they're just following through with more kills and more damage. Because that is the Ocean Drake. And to be fair, that is important when it comes to you know, the Ezreal. And it comes to the Wukong, that is extra sustainability for your team. But with that being said, it's going to be going to the side of Smart Omega instead, which would put Jin and the rest of the team at a very good spot. Yeah, I just want to point out the amazing play from Jin there. So both teams are kind of poking, right? But mm -hmm. but Omega has the better poke side. Omega has the better poking champions. Oh, never mind. Hold that off for just a moment there. Vi engaging here onto the Gragas. The wild growth has to be spent onto him. Not the longest of cooldowns, but still not the greatest. Anyway, I want to kind of finish my thought there as um, Jin, that root was everything. Right when he landed the root, it was on. And you saw mm -hmm. Omega immediately jump in. So look for that in the future. I think when we see these fights going forward, it's going to be Omega trying to poke. And when they get a good poke, it's going to be uh, game on for them. And it looks like they're actually going to be able to finish off this Baron. Infinity, I wasn't expecting them to get that. Yeah, I actually thought like 16-bit is gonna go all in on that Baron, but I think it was really dangerous for them considering what happened earlier into the Dragon. And also, you have the ultimate from the Oriana, right? You have the ultimate from the Braum as well. When you go in Untra opening, that's all in ult. And when that happens, it's probably gonna be GG for your team, right? So yeah, it was just a smart move by 16-bit. They were trying to go slowly, but on the end of the day, that's gonna put them at a very bad spot because Baron is gonna go to the side of Smart Omega. 
it, it just seemed like they had the scouting there from the Ezreal. Ezreal was able to hit three to four members with his mm -hmm. ultimate, and they it just seemed like it seemed it was a little bit too slow to the action there. And I, I was so surprised because it seemed like it was going to be an easy kind of contest there for 16 bit, even though they're down in goal. But it, you know, that's all in the past here as Omega is on the warpath. They're going to try to push down these lanes. But here comes the engage here from Camille getting onto the back line. The stasis has to come out from our, uh, remember, our Oriana here. She's a, a, Essentially going to go down and getting extremely low, but already Gragas is falling here for 60 a bit. And Camille's trying to finish off the opponents, gets onto yet another member, but she's extremely low herself. And that is going to actually be a four for two already in favor of Omega. Didn't go work out too well in the end. And that could be the finishing blow here on a uh, Wukong. Okay, that obviously is a uh, is actual um, real body there. That's an ace coming out from Omega, and they're going to probably finish this off right now, Infinity. Mm hmm. 100%. They, they have the Baron buff. There is a huge wave pushing into the base. And you also have Jin with a massive amount of burst damage potential. So this is probably going into the side of Smart Omega for game number two in the playoffs. Game one. Match one, rather.